on making a difference and letting our light shine. Maybe some time ago, maybe been doing this for two or three years, maybe longer than that, at the end of every service, I tell you, go out and be the light that you're supposed to be. And maybe the Lord said, okay, preacher, you've been talking that statement. Now let's see if we can expound on it some. So that's what we've been doing the last few weeks. Whenever Jesus came, you know, they had heard a lot of doctrines. They had heard a lot of teachings. But he came along and he's teaching stuff different than they'd ever heard before. Never a man spoke like this man. But he would talk to them about stuff, you know, the Old Testament says an eye for an eye. And he would tell them to turn the other cheek. Yeah. You know, And uh, he would bring to them maybe a new teaching to most of them anyway, to love your neighbor as yourself. And basically that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about making a difference and being the difference that we can be for the Lord. We talked about the cause which David spoke of. We talked about something that we must need do. We looked at the example of Jesus as He went through Samaria to minister to the Samaritan woman at the well and to minister to her need. Went out of His way, got out of His comfort zone, and we talked about that some. In the next couple of days, well, I guess tomorrow, He will be making New Year's resolutions. And that's, this is the way that the Lord wants us to go this morning, going along the same lines that we've been talking about. Most New Year's resolutions are centered around self. Or at least that's the way that it is with most people anyway. It's I, my, me, and mine. I want to lose weight. I want to quit smoking. Now these are not my resolutions in case you're out there listening and think I smoke. <clears throat> I want to lose weight. Now that one I can use. I want to quit smoking. I want to make more money. Amen. That's a big one. I want to get a promotion this year. I want to go farther in the occupation or the career that I've chosen. I want a better education. Amen. A lot of people will choose a lot of different things. I want a better home, better car, and on down the line. And you notice that every bit of that has to do with me. Amen. All of it has to do with self-centeredness, which, you know, and I realize there are some things that we all can do to better ourselves, but I also realize that on the top of our list should be a resolve to serve Jesus better in 2013 than we did in 2012. At the top of our list should be to minister to others more than we minister to people in the year of 2012. In order for us to ever get what we've been talking about, letting our light shine, being concerned with the cause, something that we must needs do, looking beyond ourselves, in order to ever get to that place, Brothers Lee's, we must forsake the self-centered doctrine that has infiltrated the church as we know it. And if you don't think the church of today is all about self, just listen to their sermons. Mm -hmm. Just read their best-selling books. Mm -hmm. Just pick up one of their best-selling sermon series. Mm -hmm. And it's all about me, my... It's all about everything that I have. Everything that I can do. Everything that I need. we got to get out of that somehow or another and take on the mind of Christ. You see, Jesus didn't come for Himself. Jesus didn't come to build a kingdom here on earth. He came to save that which was lost. He commissioned us whenever He went back to the Father to take His gospel, Brother Sleece, His message, to the world, to every creature. He didn't leave us here to, be build, to, be, to build big buildings. Amen? That's a lot of words there. I get tongue tied. To be builder, build bigger buildings. He didn't leave us here to build a million dollar ministry complex. I don't have anything against I don't have anything against people having things, but it gets to the place where things have people and that's where our problem's at today. I, my, me, and mine. It's all about self. And this is nothing new. This is a doctrine that the devil has preached since the beginning of time. Whenever he decided, he said, I will ascend above the most high. I will be like him. So Lucifer's always been about self. Even in the Garden of Eden, what did he turn Eve's attention to when he first started talking to her? He said, if you eat of this tree, you will surely not die, but you will be as gods. Mm -hmm. So he turns the attention on Eve. The betterment of her, the betterment of self. Self-centered. Be all that you can be. 
You can be like God. And we hear the same old mess mm -hmm. today being spewed out of our pulpits across America. Mm -hmm. The same old mess that got Eve in the trouble to eat the fruit. The church of today has eaten the forbidden fruit. I'll be as God. I'll be God. Mm -hmm. The self-centered doctrine. And if we ever want to be an effective witness for Jesus, we have to get away from the self-centered doctrine that is being taught in our churches. We have to get away from the I, my, me, and mine that is being taught and push down the throats of Christians today. Get rich. Be all you can be. What about the drunk? What about those that are in prison? What about Pastor Joseph and his family over there in India? What do you give to them? What do you give to those in third world countries that live in a hut or that live in a cardboard box? What do you give to them? Oh, you can't be in God's will unless you're rich. No, they, they know more about ministry there than they do than we do over here because it's not all about self. It's about sharing what you have with others. It's about letting your light shine before those that are in darkness. And before we can ever let our light shine, we must get away from the self-centered doctrine that was birthed in the womb of wickedness, birthed by the devil himself, that's all worried about me and what I can have. If Until we get past the part of what's, what can I get out of it, and we change our way of thinking to what can I give out of it. Yeah. Amen? Instead of what can I get, what can I give? Instead of what God can do for me, what can I do for God? Amen? Oh, you talk about a New Year's resolution. I realize that that doesn't come on top of the list of the, I'm, you know, I want to lose weight. I want to look better. I want to feel better. But this should be at the top of every one of our list if we have a heart seeking after the heart of God. Seeking after His desire. Someone asked me this past week, they said, doesn't the Bible say that He will give us the desire of our heart? And I said, sure it does. But we get so focused on thinking that that means, and I don't know if I can explain this or not, the way that I see it. That means that I can have the thing I desire instead of God change the desire of my heart. Give me the desire of my heart. Let my desire be what you desire. Amen. Not riches, not fame, not fortune, not popularity, but let my heart's desire be the very desires of the heart of God. Give me, my, give me the desire of my heart. Change it. Change it. Change the things that I want. Change my want. Change my desire to where I don't... It's not that I'm desire that I have my eyes set on the riches of the world, that I have my desire set on the things of God and what God desires. See, what God wants and what we want most of the time don't line up. Amen? God has a desire for souls to be saved. God has a desire to minister to others. That's what Jesus was all about. Everywhere you found Him, He was always ministering to somebody. He was always reaching out to somebody. And it was usually people that the religious world wouldn't have anything to do with. Amen? i got news for you. Most of the religious world wouldn't have much to do with me or anybody that's under the sound of my voice right now. But Jesus died for us. Jesus was not self-centered. You'll find that in none of His teachings. You'll find, never find when He told the disciples, go out and get rich. No, it, on the contrary. He said, when you go out, don't take no money with you. When you go out, don't take your purse. It was all about going out and ministering to the needs of others. Let's look at someone this morning. And we've looked at him before, but not in this way. We talk about Elijah and Elisha and the influence that Elijah had on the life of Elisha. And we talk about many times about what did Elisha want whenever Elijah was getting ready to be taken up into heaven. Elijah turns to him and says, tell me your heart's desire. Tell me what you would have me to do for you. We find this in 2 Kings, the second chapter. And you'd probably out there today think you know where I'm going, but you might not. 2 Kings, the second chapter. We find it's time for Elijah to be called home. And he's walking along there with Elisha. And he's getting ready to ask Elisha a question. The Bible says, we'll begin in verse 7. This whole thing is good reading, of course. All of the Word of God is. But it says, And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood 
to view afar off, and they stood by Jordan. Now these sons of the prophets, they were standing back. They wanted to see what was fixing to happen with Elijah and Elisha. And the Bible says that Elijah took his mantle, and he wrapped it together, and he smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they went, so that they too went over on dry ground. I'm in Second Kings, the second chapter, now in the ninth verse. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now we've talked about that hundreds of times. We've talked about how that Elisha could have asked for a lot of things. He was talking to a man who had raised the dead. He was talking to a man that had caused the widow woman's barrel to not go dry, to, to not cease during the time of famine. He was talking to a man who had called fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel whenever he faced down the prophets of Baal. He was talking to a man who had power. Now I might ask you, I might say to you today, you know, tell me what you want me to do for you. And you might look at me and think, man, you ain't much you can do for me. You barely get by yourself. But this man, he had power. He had saw miracles. What he hadn't seen, he had heard of. Of what this man had done. So he asked him, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. He could have asked for a lot of things, but he asked for this. We want to look today for just a few minutes at why he asked for this. Not necessarily what he asked for, but why he asked for what he asked for. He said, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and he rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that had fell from him. And he went back and he stood by the bank of Jordan. Now listen to this. My goodness. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell unto him, that fell from him, and he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the, prophets of, when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jordan saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed down themselves to the ground before him. Now, now we see that Elisha got what he asked for. He asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit. After Elijah is taken away, he throws aside his own mantle and he picks up Elijah's mantle and he goes to the river of Jordan and it parts for him the same way that it did for Elijah. The sons of the prophet, they see this and they say, oh, the spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha, and it did. Because that's what he asked for. But why did he ask for this? Did he ask for this for fame or for popularity? Oh, yeah. Elijah was real popular, wasn't he? He had a contract out on his head at one time by Jezebel. Had to run and hide in a cave. Do you remember that? Did he ask for, did he ask for what Elijah had because Elijah was rich? <laughs> Elijah had to sit up by the brook chariot and be fed out of the mouth of a, of a, 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 a buzzard's cousin and drink from the brook till it dried up. He was not a rich man. He was not a famous man as far as the as far as being held up high in popularity. He, his his uh, his relationship with God and his being the prophet was certainly spread abroad. His fame grew in that measure, but he was not popular as far as the world standards consider, concerns popularity. He was not rich. He was not someone of, of great stature in the community. He was not a successful businessman. He was not even one of the sons of the prophets that stood back and peered from afar. There was something that Elijah had that Elisha wanted, and he wanted it not because of self-gain. He didn't want this gift for fame and popularity and fortune. He wanted this gift for another reason. And if we can get a hold of this today... If we can realize today that what we seek for from God should be more for what we can do for others with it once we get it than just for ourselves. Amen? My goodness. 
If we can get a hold of the vision that Elisha had, he wanted what Elijah had, not so that he could hoard it up. Not so that it would make, not for his own personal gain, but because of what he could do for others if he had it. Let that sink in. What he could do for others if he had it. If a double portion of the same Spirit that rested on Elijah, if that same power is working in my life, then I can see to the needs of others the way that Elijah saw to the needs of others. Elijah didn't use his gift to profit. Many have today. Many today have used their gift that God has given them to profit for ill-gotten gain, for the love of money that is the root of all evil. That wasn't Elisha's intentions when he asked. He asked for a double portion of the Spirit that rested upon Elijah. Why? Not for his own personal gain but so that he could help others the way that Elijah had helped others. Elijah worked miracle after miracle before he was called home. The Lord worked through him to shut up the heavens. The Lord worked through him later to open up the heavens. He would call fire down, as I said, on Mount Carmel. He would raise the dead. He would save the widow woman and her son. Or at least he would be a vessel that was used in that. The widow woman and her son would be saved through the famine. He parted Jordan just before they went over and he was taken up into heaven. No, it wasn't fame or fortune or popularity or earthly gain that Elisha sought for. That's not why he sought a double portion of what Elijah had and it is borne out in the facts of Elisha's life once the anointing rested upon him. It was for what he had with the Lord. He wanted what Elijah had. Not for his own self. Not solely for his own self. Of course it would benefit him. But for the benefit of others. There's a strange thought to think about others before we think about ourselves. And we find this time and time again too many times to give, give you the examples this morning. You see, Elisha wasn't like, what, I, what can I get out of this? But what can I give out of this? The first thing he would do, of course he parted the river Jordan, but the first thing he would do that dealt with other people, he would heal the waters of Jericho. 2 Kings, the second chapter, if you go all the way down to the 19th verse, the Bible says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord said, but the water is not and the ground is barren. And he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. Now what was this to Elisha? He could have said, well, it's tough, boys. I'm going to move on down the line where there's some water that's good. But he doesn't. With the gift that he asked for from Elijah, oh, my Lord. He says, I can help you. Bring me a cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth into the spring of the waters and he cast the salt therein and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from, from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha which he spake. The very next thing that he would do as far as interacting with other people in the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Kings we find a prophet's widow, and most scholars, all the scholars that I could find on this, believe that this was Obadiah's wife. Obadiah had passed on. It says in 2 Kings 4 and 1, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what, what hast thou in thine house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Now what do we see here? We see a widow woman who was married to a prophet at one time, more than likely the prophet Obadiah. And apparently they were, when he passed on, they were left with some debt. And the creditor said, Well, you can't pay it, widow woman, so we're going to take your sons. We're going to put them in debtor's prison. We're going to make them bondmen. So she comes running to the prophet. Now, does the Bible say anything about her having to pay a fee to see this prophet? Doesn't say anything, does it? 
I bring that up because I talked to a preacher a little while back who paid $1,000 to have a private meeting with a pastor. If I told you his name, you'd know who I'm talking about. Paid him $1,000 just to be able to hear because he wanted to share some of his wisdom with them. But you had to pay $1,000 to get in. $1,000 ahead. Going to tell them a secret. Of course, the preacher that I was talking to couldn't tell me the secret because they I didn't pay the $1,000. But and I think maybe the secret was that. Maybe the secret to his success was that. Finding some preachers to pay him $1,000 to, to hear his secret. But she didn't have to worry about coming up with no money. There's one popular preacher. If I told you his name, you'd know him very well. If you go and spend a night with him, you got to buy a ticket. Elisha wasn't selling tickets because what he asked for from Elijah was not for self-gain. It, it was for the gain of others. Not for his own betterment, for, but for the betterment of others. Not solely for his own benefit, but for the benefit of others. So what's he do? He says, what do you have in your house? She says, well, I have a pot of oil. Then he said, go and borrow. Go and borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. In other words, go get all the vessels you can lay your hands on. Empty vessels. Can you imagine what she's thinking? She's thinking, what in the world? I only have a pot of oil in my house. But listen what happens. This is that gift working in Elisha's life that he sought for from the prophet Elijah whenever he left. Not for his own, just for solely for his own benefit, but for the benefit of others. What can I do for others? Not so much what others can do for me. What can, what can I do for God and not so much what God can do for me? What can I make out of this? Or what can I get out of this? What can I gain from this? No, but what can I give from this? And it says... And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour into, in, out unto all these vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Now listen to what this woman does. So she went from him, and she shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought in the vessels to her. Now they went and they borrowed all the vessels they get hold of. And she poured out, she took this one pot of oil that she had. She only had one pot of oil. I don't know how big it was. It's bigger than this, I'm sure. But wouldn't borrow all the vessels they could borrow. Now listen to what happened. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go and sell the oil and pay the debt and live thou and thy children on the rest or of the rest. Listen to that. She don't have but one pot of oil in all the house. The prophet says, you go and you get all the empty vessels. You go over to, you go over to Jane's house. And you go over to Marvin's house. And you go over to Steve's house. And you borrow all the empty buckets they got. She goes and borrows them all and brings them in. So you take them that right there and you pour that into them. Well, common sense would tell you that ain't going to work. She takes it and she pours into that vessel. That vessel's full. Set it over there. Finds another vessel. Opens it up. That vessel's full. Set it over there. Give me another. Finally she turns to her son and says, Bring me another pot. I said, Ain't no more. Fills all of these vessels with one pot of oil. Oh, my, my, my. That remind you of anything that took place in Elijah's life? Whenever he was over there with the, with the widow woman, where he went down to Zarephath and all she had was a little bit of meal, meal and a little bit of oil. And the Bible says they used of that every day, day after day, until the famine was gone. It didn't, it didn't cease. It didn't waste. It wasn't empty. Same thing happens with this woman. Elijah used his gifts to help other people. Elijah's using the gift that he asked of Elijah to help other people. The church is supposed to use their gifts to help other people. Not for ill-gotten gain or to promote self but to be a minister to other people. That's a strange concept in the day that we live in today because the church of today is all about self. It's all about gain. It's all about prosperity when it should be all about everybody but you. What's the next thing he would do? Verse 8, 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. I'm giving you these examples and we're not going to be able to, to go through all of them, but I'm telling you why Elisha 
We know what he asked for. We've heard that preached. We've heard that he could have asked for money. He could have asked for fortune. He could have asked for whatever. But he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. We know what he asked for. This morning we find out why he asked for what he asked for. The next thing you find him doing in the 4th chapter, the 8th verse, 2 Kings, you find him interacting with a Shunammite woman. It says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunam. There was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was, that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. In other words, a place for him to rest. A place for him to lighten his load, and to stop by and be refreshed before he goes on his journey. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and he lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. Now listen. And said unto him, unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. When he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaiden. And the woman conceived and bare a son in that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. Now we find Elisha calling her to him and saying, What can I do for you? Do you see a pattern developing here in the life of Elisha? Is it hard for us to figure out now why he asked for the double portion? We don't see him using it for riches. We don't see him selling tickets to his gatherings. We don't see him building some type of earthly kingdom. We don't see him gaining from this. Not naturally, but he was spiritually. And he was taking that which God had given to him and he was giving it to others. That's what our calling is today. That's why we are supposed to be the light of the world. Not so that we can hoard it, not so that we can hide it, not so that we can catch lightning in a bottle, screw the top shut, never let it out. But so that we let that light shine into the darkness of other people and be the light of the world that we're supposed to be. Elisha wanted what Elijah had. But Elisha didn't want it for Elisha's own benefit. He wanted it so that he could take that not so much what can I get out of it, what can I give out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I wish we could get that today. Not what I can get, but what I can give. Not what God can do for me, not what others can do for me, but what I can do for God, what I can do for others. Wouldn't that be a power? Wouldn't the church be so much better off if that was our New Year's resolution? Wouldn't the church be so much better off if we resolved to do that and we didn't let it fall to the side like most New Year's resolutions do? But we were determined in our heart in the year of 2013 to do more for Jesus, to do more for others than we did in, in 2012. In the year 2012, this ministry in its 26 years of existence has reached, we reached more people in 2012 than we ever had before. But now's not the time to pull in the reins and say we've accomplished because we haven't. Now's the time to reach more. Now's the time to push forward. Now is the time to put our hand to the plow and not look back and realize that our time is short and we must do what we must do for God while we have time. Not what we can get, but what we can give. And you find on and on and on things that Elijah, Elijah would do. The next thing you find him doing, he would heal the food. They went out to the field and this is in the fourth chapter as well, a little bit further down. They went out in the field with the sons of the prophets. They were hungry drought in the land. They went out and they gathered some, some leaves and some spices and some herbs and they fixed the pot and everybody was fixing to sit down and eat. And somebody cried, there's death in the pot! It was poison. I guess they got a hold of some bad mushrooms. And Elijah would take some, Elisha, excuse me, would take some meal and he would heal the pot and they would eat. 
Then he would take in 2 Kings, the 4th chapter, the 42nd verse. It says it is in the same place, in the drought, in the place where the people are starving. There came a man from Baalsha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, 20 loaves of bread, and he brought him some ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Elijah, Elisha tells him to give it to the people so that they can eat. And his servant said, What? Should I set before a hundred men just these few things that I brought? And he said, Give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, They shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. In, in, in other words, the same as with the few fishes and the loaves that Jesus did for the 5,000. Elisha does the same thing here for these people that are starving to death. And the, the Spirit of the Lord working through him. Don't get me wrong. All of this is done by the Spirit of the Lord. Done through the gift which Elisha sought for. Many people have begged for a gift from God and when they got it, they didn't use it right. Elisha wasn't like that. He said, you take those hundred loaves and you take those ears of corn and you feed these people, but it's not enough, Master. Oh, do what, I, do what the Word of the Lord says. Feed them. See, little is much when God is in it. You may not know how you're going to get by. The little widow woman didn't know how she was going to get by. She's going to fix her some, a little cake and she's going to die, but God is more than able to multiply. Oh, I've seen it in my own life. I have seen God multiply. When you thought there was no way you can make it, God always made a way. He does that here through the gift that Elisha sought for. And we see, we know what he asked for. Now we know why. Time and time again, this pattern that took place in his life of helping others. Not what I can get out of it, but what I can give out of it. Oh, that's good. Amen. Hallelujah. So what do we see Elisha resolve to do? And I'm closing. He wanted more of God and more of the Spirit. Why? Why? to do the work of the Lord for the betterment of the ministry to others. Not for fame, not for self. You see, he wouldn't fit in in today's world, religious world. Later he would cleanse Naaman. He would go on. He would do more and more. In total, it is recorded that he did twice the miracles of Elijah, which fits since he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. He would have many. Now, did, do we read where he gained a bunch of money and was great and rich? No, but he did have several people that wanted to follow in his footsteps. Now, what their goal was, I don't know, but we know what Elisha's goal was because we see that here. We see why he followed in Elijah's footsteps. We see why he asked for a double. Even whenever Elijah turned to him and said, you stay here, I'm going to go on. He said, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. Even then, it wasn't a selfish thing. Even then, he knew that if he could... If he can have a portion, much less a double portion, of the relationship that Elijah had with God, all the good he can do with that. My goodness. And he did just that with the gift that was bestowed upon him. Not what he could get out of it, but what he could give out of it. Our desire today should be what God desires. I don't, know if I, I don't know if you can get that this morning. I don't know if I can explain it good enough. But that done something for me. I want more light. Not so that I can hide the light. But so that more light will shine through my life to reach others. Not so that I can hide it under... Do you remember the five foolish and the five wise? And I'm not going to go there, but you know, those, you know it well. You know this example very well from the Word of God. The Bible says at midnight there was a cry made, cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. And the Bible says that the five wise arose and the five foolish did too. They began to trim their lamps. Of course, the foolish didn't have any oil. But the five wise, they trimmed their lamps. And they, Why do you trim a lamp? So it burned brighter. At midnight. And if we ever lived in the midnight hour, it's today. If we ever needed to be trimming our lamps so that they'll shine brighter, it's today. If we ever needed to make sure that we have oil in our vessel to shine the light, not for the betterment of self, sure, the light is, is a benefit to us, but it also is a lamp for others. A light for others. A, a, a light to show others the way as well. The Bible says, do you light a candle to stick it under a bushel? No. You light a candle, put it on the candlestick so that it will give light unto all them 
that are in the house. Not for the betterment of one, but for the betterment of many. Not what I can get out of it, but what can I give out of it. And at midnight is the time whenever we ought to be letting our light shine even more than before. And all you have to do is turn on the news and realize that we are living in the last days. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. The vision today, our vision today, our goal today should be to make a difference for Jesus. And in the upcoming year, as we make all of... I've got a list of resolutions. At the top of mine is to do more for Jesus than I did in 2012. And if the Lord tarries, mine for 2014 will be to do more for Jesus in 2014 than I do in 2013. Jesus would look at him once and He would say, He had to do the works of the Father while there was day because the night soon cometh when no man can work. I wish I could get the church awake enough to realize how close we are to the end of time. How close we are to checking out of here. Even if the Lord doesn't return sometime soon, somebody, somebody's going to die sooner or later. I don't know which one of us is going to check out first. But we all have a number. We all have a time. Appointed unto man wants to die. Amen. We will never be able to make a difference for Christ until we forsake the self-centered doctrine that has infiltrated the modern day church of today. We must look beyond our own needs and see the needs of others in order to make a difference. And the greatest need of others is the need for Jesus. That's what it was all about for Jesus. That's what it's got to be. That's what it's got to be all about for us today. The ministry of others. Reaching farther, reaching more, being a light to more people that are in darkness. Doing more for those that are lost, dying, hurting, that need to be ministered to. You say, well, there's a church on every corner. There's a preacher on every channel. Yeah, but the truth is rare. Mm -hmm. The truth is rare this morning, Brother Sleaze. Yeah. Oh, you can pick whatever church. There's There are all kind of churches out there. You can, you can pick one. You probably can't drive two blocks in most cities without at least seeing one church. But the truth is more rare than the churches are. Can't turn on the television this morning without catching a preacher on one of the channels. we got, what, 200 channels? Probably catch two or three preachers, four or five. You won't find the truth so easy to be found this morning. Thank God for the truth. Lord, let us all be the light we're supposed to be. To help others. To reach out. To be His hand extended. That's what Elisha wanted. To be God's hand extended. That's why he asked for what he asked for. Someone else this morning have something?